Testing one, two, three. Mary had a little lamb. Lisa wanted to snow. Uh, back home, uh, 
buildings and that was the public library. Museum still occupied the top floor, and they're moving into some more space on the top floor. And so it's going to be used uh, more and more. Well, as I mentioned, we were going to do this uh, tape history. We got started on it uh, last winter, and it was really a lot of fun. Uh, uh, Dave and I met two or three times during the uh, earlier history of the college. And then when we got up into the 30s and 40s, I invited in uh, the gamblers. Gamets uh, did uh, some of the late 30s. And then very young, Dorothy Bell and Edith Jordan uh, also were invited to uh, be interviewed and contributed to their experience here in the, uh, the late 30s and the 40s. Uh, Jack and Marty Taylor, uh, also uh, very good with you, and we thought we'd really have something very good. Well, if you've had a computer, you know what happens every now and then, oh. they crash. Oh. And uh, unfortunately, uh, whatever they were using for backup, it didn't work, and consequently, we're going to have to start all over again on that uh, particular project. But uh, so we do not have uh, this uh, tape recorded history uh, for you. So maybe you would all like to take notes and we can uh, forget about the, uh, the taking of the history. <coughs> uh, one other thing I might add uh, regarding this building, I don't know how much you uh, know about this particular building. Uh, I'm sure most of you recognize the site uh, that was used to be the Turner Hotel uh, site, and then uh, after uh, the time, well, late in the history of it all, it became Turner Hall uh, and then his dormitory uh, for the uh, uh, college. Uh, one, one brief story about it as a dormitory was that there was one resident of uh, the uh, hotel, John Drove, who was a longtime lawyer here at Fairfield, and uh, he didn't want to leave when the hotel was turned over to the college. And indeed, after the fellows started moving in uh, from the campus and from other colleges involved, John was having a wonderful time. And he was sort of, I think, reliving some of his own college days by having all these college boys around and so forth. And they had a good time uh, with, with John and so forth. And so it was quite a job prying him out uh, of the uh, hotel and into uh, other quarters. Well, sad to say, after the uh, college closed, by the uh, but the building stood empty for a while, and then uh, one of those things that happened to an empty building, that you never quite know how or why it happened, but uh, it was uh, uh, burned to the ground one night, and before the uh, fire department could really get anything uh, hose on it, why well, there wasn't much of the old building left. So what happened to this site was for uh, quite a few years, many of you were back for some of the reunions in the 80s. You might remember it as a parking lot. It was a municipal parking lot for a number of years. And then when the project got underway to select a site for the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, as it came to be called out, the working title for the project was the Jefferson County Civic Center. And that was the name that was used for a long time to uh, identify it and describe it. And eventually, we, uh, they decided there were, that this would be a good location across from the courthouse, near the square, uh, and uh, near uh, what eventually would become the farmer's market site, and so on. And so the, the city, uh, you know, part of its contribution to the project, uh, contributed the municipal parking lot and uh, the site of the Turner Hotel and becomes the site of the Fairfield uh, Arts and Convention Center. 
Uh, another thing to keep in mind, part of the background of this building, is many of you recall the several that I've talked to uh, before uh, this uh, meeting got away, uh, are from the uh, 61, 63, 4. And so you would remember the Parsons Summer Festivals. And uh, there are lots of people who have remembered that uh, activity with great pleasure. And so part of the background for having this building is to eventually recreate something along the line of the Summer uh, Festival. This really was a project for the younger generation. Uh, those of us that were getting to be gray beards and had a lot of gray in the hair, uh, some of us were very supportive of the project, but it really was a younger group uh, that got it uh, underway. And one of the, well, the earliest architect in the project uh, was the daughter of Dorothy Bell, who is sitting here with us, and she did a lot of preliminary work uh, in getting this building Building. I think Dorothy you told me that there is a seat in the Sinai Theater that uh, is dedicated uh, uh, to Martha. So, uh, more connections between the, uh, Martha was not a graduate of Parsons College, but uh, a lot of connection between the Parsons people, people connected with the college, and with this particular uh, project. So. Those are a few of the pre preliminary remarks that I, I wanted to uh, make. And then I thought, because I certainly agree with Susan Colton Wellesley, and who wrote a delightful uh, history of Fairfield, and she called it a Fairfield. And she devotes a chapter uh, to the history of Parsons College uh, from the beginning until uh, about 1963, when she uh, finished writing the book and uh, got it to the publisher. And she refers to Parsons College as a Cinderella college. And some of you who have, who have read the book may recall that. I just wanted to read to you uh, what she says in the opening paragraph of her chapter about why she calls it uh, Cinderella College. And she says, and I quote, when Dr. Miller Roberts became president of Parsons College in 1955, he worked the magic spell which ostensibly transformed a Cinderella College into a princess at the educational ball. The resulting national publicity, favorable and unfavorable, created such a hullabaloo of claims and counterclaims that for a public with short memories, the original Parsons is now almost forgotten. And I have to agree with her. I have known many uh, people talked to with uh, who assumed that Parsons College dated uh, from 1955 and that there wasn't a, a college for many decades uh, before that. And so, uh, Susan relied heavily on Willis Parsons' 50 years of Parsons College for much of the early history. And what I know of the early history of the college, I rely very heavily on Willis Parsons also. And his book, 50 Years of Parsons College, we do have some copies of it in the public library. And I hope that there may be some copies of it in the museum uh, we'll have available. Uh, Lewis Parsons was a grandson of the Lewis Baldwin Parsons, who had specified in his will back in 1855 that he was leaving the bulk of his estate to an endowment fund to create a college in Iowa. Now, as I said, Lewis Parsons was grandson, and he was a president of Parsons College in roughly the first decade of the 20th century. And uh, after uh, he had uh, resigned from the presidency, because his health was, uh, was damaged, 
Uh, he and some of the other members of the family also descended from uh, those Parsons, uh, uh, raised the money, contributed the money, to build Parsons Hall. And what they planned to have, and what was there uh, for quite a few years, was that it would be uh, the Bible Institute. And uh, indeed, uh, Willis Parsons uh, became uh, the chairman of the Biblical uh, Institute, the office and classrooms and all in Parsons Hall. And the building was designed by the same architect that we did the chapel, and so it's in the same style. And you recall that it was connected to the chapel by that covered arcade, which occasionally, if the weather was bad and we were having a formal convocation, the faculty would assemble in Parsons Hall and then march to the chapel, um, being at least partially sheltered uh, by that arcade. Uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Parsons also had uh, built, uh, as to be his home eventually, uh, the house known as Broadview, uh, which is what he called it. And uh, afterwards, for many years, as I understand it, I've never knew her, but as I understand it, it became the home of Miss Julia uh, Parsons, uh, another descendant. Uh, of the original founder, and she liked to say that she enjoyed living there because that way she could keep an eye uh, on what was happening uh, over at the college. At the time that Willis Parsons and his wife and then Miss Julia lived there, that was not part of the Parsons campus. And uh, I remember when I first came here in the fall of 1955, I wondered why there were side by side gate posts. There were gate posts that you went through beyond Carter Drive on the campus, past Fairfield Hall and all. And then right next, just north of those gate posts, were the gate posts for the drive into this big, big house, which when I came to was the student center. Well, I found out later that while it was the entrance to a private property, the uh, property of the Parsons family, and then uh, it became, after Miss Julia passed away, it became part of the college campus. And uh, I recall that the first floor uh, was the student center, and I often had breakfast there and all, and, and lunch. And on the second floor, uh, Professor L.D. Pruitt and his wife, Leah, uh, had their apartment. And then you may recall that uh, down, the, down just to the east of it uh, was Mary Lee House. And uh, on one floor, the Dorset family. And if I remember correctly, I think the Palmers uh, had the other floor, the second floor, or maybe the, uh, vice versa. And then on beyond that, was a small uh, frame cottage directly north of uh, a viewing hall. And this was the home, and I think was the home of the Sells family. And it was known as Turner House or Turner Hall. And it was had been the home of Jim Turner and his family. And he was the long time uh, chief custodian of Parsons College for, uh, for the campus and the buildings. For well, 40 some years, he and then his son took over for him, from him in uh, keeping the buildings uh, clean and repaired and so forth. So it was a family that was very, very close to the uh, background of the college. Well, that's some of the, and gradually you see these buildings have been built as private residences in an earlier period, all eventually were acquired by the college uh, to enlarge the campus. And then there's one, uh, one or two other things I've just mentioned here. I will recall uh, at least some that were here in the 50s, late 50s, that uh, beyond 
uh, Broadview and Mary Lee Files, well, there was an orchard, an apple orchard. And uh, I think generations of students enjoyed going down there and helping themselves to the apples. Those were not originally uh, part of the campus, but uh, evidently the uh, people that owned the orchard didn't object too strenuously. And then one other thing there is, a, I don't know the, the background of this building at all, but right out on the highway, very close uh, to the bridge uh, over the, and on the highway under which Crow Creek flows, was the canteen. And uh, uh, I don't know how many generations of students uh, like to go down to the canteen. I remember it was the kind of building that if you were a stranger coming through town, and you were interested in getting a place to have lunch, you'd probably pass right by it. Uh, but uh, when you found out that uh, David Chatsworth prepared very good food, well, it was a good place to go to breakfast or lunch. And uh, a lot of us were very sorry when uh, she decided to sell the property uh, to the college and uh, retire. But uh, I think probably she deserved to retire by that time, which has been at it quite a long time. One other thing, uh, adjacent to the canteen property, there were three or four uh, trailers and were occupied a long time by various students. And I do recall one time, I had a class in the basement on our ground floor of Foster Hall, and it was raining cats and dogs, the monsoon. It was with us, and we passed some of that this summer. And uh, there was a knock at the door, and I uh, went open, and it was one of our maintenance people wanting to know if so and so uh, was there. And I said, Well, yes, he is. And uh, he said, Well, would you tell him he'd better get to his trailer quickly? The creek is coming up. <laughs> and <laughs> this student was out like a shot. And I uh, saw him later. And yes, he had managed to get uh, his things up high and retrieve some of his belongings. So, uh, but you may recall that Crow Creek had a way uh, of coming up uh, very, very rapidly. And finally, the college did undertake to exercise a little control over it by building a low dam and creating uh, a large pond, in which, believe it or not, the Board of Trustees devoted considerable time to discussing at one point what to call it and deciding to call it what the students were already calling it, Lake Louise. And the Board officially uh, named it that. And uh, there is, some of you may have seen the picture of a Pepsi truck that had slipped off the bridge that was going over the creek on the campus, slipped off the bridge, and was there uh, up to its hubcaps and beyond uh, in the water. And I never did see the record coming to get it out of there, but uh, by the end of the day, it had disappeared. And so I'm sure the Pepsi people got their truck, uh, truck back. Well, those are a few little of the <coughs> anecdotes about the property. Uh, now we'll pick up where uh, Susan, what will he uh, go? Yes, sir. Lake Louise. <coughs> After Dr. Roberts. After Mrs. Roberts. And some of you who had Mrs. Roberts may remember that uh, she had a machine gun like uh, delivery. And I remember that I introduced her at a luncheon one time, and Dr. Roberts was there, and I introduced her. As, and, he, and he was going to be the main speaker at the luncheon. But I introduced her and I said, and you all know, you dropped your pencil, you've lost a century. <laughs> and Roberts is doubled up with laughter. And, you know, I couldn't really believe it, but uh, apparently neither of them had ever heard that before. And all I was doing really was repeating what students said to me. <laughs> but, uh, she just, and you know, you rarely saw her much more than a smile, but she was convulsed, and he was just doubled up. And uh, so we got the, we got the whole thing off to a good, a good start. 
course, it could be a lot of blue, too, to, to work out very well. Well, at any rate, because uh, Susan refers to the fact that so many people have forgotten that the college, that there was a Parsons College before 1955, we'll go back uh, a little bit to the beginning. And the beginning uh, starts with Lewis, Paul, and Parsons, whose uh, ancestry can be traced back uh, to 1636, when the first members of Parsons' family uh, arrived in New England, and several more arrived between 1636 and 1640. And so the family grew and developed and so forth. Now, Lewis Parsons uh, was born in the little frontier town. Hard to believe that he could be on the frontier, but uh, in the little frontier town of Williams, Massachusetts, uh, in 1793. And his grandson, Willis Parsons, the future president, or was the president of college, suggests, he doesn't say in fact, he suggests that maybe the fact that Williams College was founded in the same year that his grandfather was born, and his grandfather grew up with Williams College developing and growing and all, that this may have influenced his interest in establishing a college in the future. Because he was not, he was not an educator, he was not a clergyman, uh, he, he was a businessman, a merchant, and like a great many merchants in the early years of the 19th century and, and ever since, uh, he and Mrs. Uh, uh, Parsons, they had a, a struggle, but gradually they prospered and uh, finally uh, well established uh, in eventually where he really settled and made uh, his uh, modest uh, fortune. Uh, was in Buffalo, New York. But in the process, his health uh, broke down. And <clears throat> again, we don't know exactly what the problem was. My guess is that he may well have had what they used to call consumption. Because his doctor recommended uh, a long uh, horseback trip, no automobiles, of course, in those days, horseback trip out to the west. And so he did. He did actually two trips. One that took him out to Texas, and then uh, in the early 1850s, the uh, trip that I think was really important from our standpoint, and that was a trip to Keokuk, where he, where he went and his younger sons made his home. And so he went out, visited his son, and then he took a horseback trip around through Iowa, which was very much a frontier uh, operation. It, <clears throat> statehood arrived in 1846, uh, but it's only really a ribbon along the Mississippi that was well settled uh, by the 1850 and coming out here in this southern tier of counties bordering on Missouri. But he was very impressed with the land that he saw, and he wound up dying. <clears throat> Uh, about 3,500 acres in central Iowa. And according to uh, Mrs. Welby, uh, he paid probably about a dollar and a half uh, per acre. And uh, now uh, an acre of that is hundreds and hundreds uh, of dollars. So uh, that was the basic, uh, basis of his endowment the college. In 1855, he drew up his will <laughs> and he specified that uh, he wanted to leave the bulk of his estate uh, to form an endowment for a college which he wanted to establish in Iowa. He didn't specify a town, just to be in Iowa. He didn't want it to be a really sectarian college, but he says in his uh, statement, that he believes that a connection with the Christian faith is important, 
And so he specified that he would like to have his college connected to the Presbyterian Church. Well, 1855 was a start, really, and already, already underway, of a tumultuous period in American history. He died a few months after drawing up the will, and in the years between 1855 and 1860, uh, of course, the situation was deteriorating until war broke out. Uh, and his oldest son, who was designated as the chief executor of the will, uh, while he was really past military age, uh, he was a friend uh, and former uh, business associate of one Captain George McClellan, uh, who became, uh, early in the war, the commander of the Army of the Potomac. And so uh, Parsons appealed to him could you help me? I, could I be on your staff and help you in any way uh, that I might to possibly do? Well, McClellan pulled the necessary strings and uh, got. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll take a little bit of it now. And. Uh, Parsons became a, a captain on McClellan's staff. Now, uh, I'll stop at this point on uh, Lewis Parsons, Jr. Because John Braidwood of uh, the Parsons Foundation and Columbus and College and all has dug up a lot of material about uh, Parsons, Jr. And I think he wants to talk about it uh, at the dedication a little bit later. So I don't want to uh, steal his talk, but uh, that kind of, bit of material that will be in the uh, museum, the library, uh, dealing with. But General Clark, he became a major general uh, by the end of the war, and a very distinguished career, uh, which is practically unknown. Uh, I, I've taught American history at college here at Parsons, but I, Iowa Wesleyan for years. I have yet to find an American history textbook that even mentions his name. And yet, uh, he did have a really remarkable career, which I think John uh, will talk some about. Well, it wasn't until after the war was over that the Parsons brothers uh, were finally able uh, to uh, start really trying to put their father's will into effect. By that time, by the late 1860s, there were two uh, Presbyterian synods in Iowa, the North Synod and the South Synod. Very imaginative names. But uh, at any rate, uh, the uh, two synods were interested. There were several communities, Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, Muscatine, all were interested. but. None of them seemed to be able to persuade the executors that they were just right for their father's endowment. And things kind of languished for a while, and then about 1873, uh, Reverend Reed, who was the local Fairfield Presbyterian pastor, uh, began to stir things up here in Fairfield. They'd never thought of Fairfield before, but he began to stir up interest here in Fairfield. And we ought to get that college, get them to come here. Well, the end result was that a committee was formed, and on it was James Wilson, among other people, who was a future senator uh, from uh, Iowa. And they invited the Parsons executives to come here, which they did. And uh, two things really impressed the executive and led to these. Dr. Tree, Dr. Yes. Tree, we have a brand new student we'd like to introduce to the class. Mr. Lee T. Showing up to me 
making this a great success. We owe a lot to this committee. There's been a parade going on, so I'm trying to be two places at once this morning, but I'll soon be back and join you for the day. There's Big John. <laughs> Have a good time. See you later. Thank you, man.
And I remember that I had my office uh, on the second floor and then later on the first floor in the building. And uh, the, when I really came here, it was really the music building. You hear the chorus uh, practices and so on <coughs> from it. Um, the, uh, board, the new board of trustees that they organized and uh, General Parsons was the first president of it for a short time until uh, he was able to turn it over to another trustee and all. But they decided that they would build one additional building right away and to try to have it open for the beginning of classes. And of course, as you might expect, the first building was a chapel, uh, which was built about 100 feet uh, to the uh, west. Uh, during all of the you can mention. The uh, original, uh, it, it served a dual purpose. The main floor, the ground floor, was chapel, and the second floor, uh, classroom space, and a small library, uh, and that sort of thing. So it did uh, double duty. It didn't quite get it open in time for the beginning of classes, but uh, it opened in the late fall uh, of 1875 and uh, served for a number of years. And there's some interesting uh, descriptions of activities that went on uh, in it uh, and all. The uh, building was eventually uh, to be enlarged by building what was called Anthony Hall uh, after a, you know, Mr. Anthony, a merchant. Uh, from Des Moines, who contributed about fifteen twenty thousand dollars for the construction of wings that kind of wrapped around the chapel. So the chapel was kind of closed uh, by Anthony Hall, and, uh, which was a much larger uh, building. The uh, original students uh, registration in the fall of seventy five. Uh, the first day, some 40 students showed up, and uh, there was very rigorous examination. You know, <clears throat> there really weren't very many high schools, and there certainly weren't in Iowa in that period. And uh, so they had to be examined as to whether they were ready for college work or whether they needed preparation. And many of the early colleges in Iowa and elsewhere developed a preparatory department uh, which operated for two years uh, in order to bring the students up uh, to what the faculty would consider college level and ready to do uh, college work. Uh, eventually these preparatory departments disappeared as secondary education uh, takes hold in the country and increasingly states would start putting in standards of what must be met uh, by students uh, to get a high school uh, diploma. But uh, in the beginning, they really had to do some examination. So out of all of the students that they uh, examined that first day, they concluded that I think two uh, were ready to do college work, and the other 30 some uh, needed to be in the preparatory department. The other thing that happened that day uh, had been unlooked for was that several young ladies showed up and wanted to be admitted to the college. Now, there is nothing in the charter that was drawn up for the college that said that women couldn't be students, but there was nothing in it that said they could be. And the girls were smart enough to point this out to the two trustees and all who were uh, there examining the students. And the trustees being practical men, the girls came with money in hand. And uh, so they were admitted. Uh, I remember telling about this back in the early 60s when this looked like a men's college. And a lot of fellows couldn't believe uh, that uh, it hadn't always been intended uh, that way. 
And I, I'll sidetrack just a bit. The oldest college in the state uh, is Lawrence College. And Iowa Wesleyan, and one of its officials said, you've got to get the words just right. Iowa Wesleyan is the oldest college, west of the Mississippi, oldest coeducational college west of the Mississippi. And the real difference is that Wesleyan admitted women Loris was a men's college until rather recently. And so you've got to get those words in. And Bob and Parsons College is one of the oldest, but not the oldest, uh, colleges west of Mississippi to be co-educational. And it would seem rather accidentally, but uh, it was co-educational from the very beginning. Well, over the, uh, over the years, uh, there were the ups and downs. Uh, one of the worst things that happened uh, in the uh, late, uh, uh, toward the end of the 19th century, was that uh, one evening, uh, one of the young Turner boys uh, looked out the window from the little, little house there toward the Anthony Hall and noticed a bright light on the second floor. floor. Unfortunately, it was a fire in the chemistry lab. And before the fire department could get here, why, the building burned to the ground. Now remember, that Parsons College, we think of it as being well within the city limits. And of course, we have fire trucks and all. In those days, uh, the uh, fire department had to pull a handcart out, and so by the time they got here, the building was gone. And college was due to open that fall in about two weeks. Fortunately, Ballard Hall had just been completed. Now, Ballard Hall was supposed to be, uh, and was built to be, a women's dormitory. But very quickly, the building was converted to classrooms, and some supplies and books and laboratory equipment were purchased and the college opened one week late. And but if they hadn't had Ballard Hall, uh, if it hadn't been completed when it was, uh, there might not have been any Parsons College after that. But open they did, and on they went. But then we enter into a period here in the early 20th century. We enter into a period of growth and building. And the buildings were built. This seems to be something of a magnet to interest and bring more students in and more faculty. And the college surely that was growing. And we have a period here uh, in the uh, late uh, century, in the early 20th, that President Ewing was here, and uh, things that uh, seem to grow very well. I just uh, say what happened here. Uh, <coughs> uh, Thomas Foster, of Otomo and part of the Morell uh, family had come on the board of trustees a number of years before the Ankeny Hall fire. Well, he, uh, he donated uh, several thousands of dollars at the old Foster Hall, which is still very much in use. It is uh, part of the Maharshi uh, High School and Elementary uh, School uh, campus there. And indeed, when they put a second building in, uh, they designed it uh, with definite uh, reference to Foster Hall, so the two buildings complement uh, each other. Mr. Foster also was responsible uh, for getting Andrew Carnegie uh, to donate a library uh, to the college. Now, uh, Carnegie had been approached by a couple of members of the board of trustees and one of the presidents of the college uh, about giving a library to the college. And, uh, but he had a number of things that he wanted the, the college to come up with uh, before he would give the money to the California library. The Parsons people felt that it was just too costly, they couldn't afford it, and so uh, the idea 
uh, was, was cool. But it so happened that Foster, uh, in the early uh, 1903, was on his way to Europe, and a fellow passenger happened to be Andrew Carnegie. And uh, Foster was acquainted with him, and so Foster made a pitch to him. And this time, uh, Carnegie said, forget all the conditions. I gave you $15,000, and you got a library. Imagine, 15,000 builds a library. Not today, it's your library. But it was a wonderful, a wonderful gift. And the building uh, was built, and uh, was uh, the library used by uh, Carson students for generations uh, thereafter. Now, when I came, I was told that uh, Fairfield was the only uh, town in the country that had two Carnegie libraries, one the public library and the other the college. Well, we had uh, Professor Wall, biographer of Andrew Carnegie, here as a speaker one time. So I put the question to him uh, before the dinner and all of this week. Is that really true? And he said, well, I'm sorry to say it's not quite true. It's not very, not very many, but Fairfield is not unique in having two Carnegie libraries. So it kind of uh, blew that uh, myth out of the water, but it is true. No, uh, there weren't a lot of them. Uh, so we've got Foster gave that at the Foster Hall, Carnegie gave his library, and the citizens of Fairfield and Jefferson County, particularly Fairfield, raised the money to build what we knew as Fairfield Hall. And so the city of Fairfield, people of Fairfield, uh, did it again. Uh, they had raised the money to begin with, and now in an hour of need, uh, they raised again money to build a building that served very well for many, many years uh, as a classroom. And then in 1908, a member of the Board of Trustees, uh, Theodore Barheit, uh, contributed money uh, to build Barheit Chapel. And uh, it was completed about 1910. And at that time, uh, Barheit also contributed uh, the pipe organ that uh, many of you would remember was there in the council, uh, was up there in the fire loft and all that. Now, a little bit of uh, fast forward here a bit. In the very early 60s, around 1961, I think it was, uh, Dr. Roberts brought in a, an architect from New York who specialized in church interiors. And the interior of our high chapel uh, was modernized. And at that time, the, a new and larger a pipe organ was installed, and uh, the old, uh, the original pipe organ. The story is, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but the story is that some student asked Dr. Roberts, "What are you going to do with the old pipe organ?" And Roberts said, "If you want it, you can have it." Now that's the story. I can't, uh, I can't vouch uh, for its authenticity, but anyway, I don't really know what happened to the original, but. The uh, organ that succeeded it, and that many of you will have heard Jean Wakes playing, because uh, she was going to be a college organist when uh, that organ was installed. Uh, when the Maharshi people uh, several years ago decided that they wanted to have the space where Barha Chapel took in and wanted to tear it down and build something new, and uh, that caused quite a hullabaloo in the community. And uh, the interim pastor of the Presbyterian Church who really kind of took a hold of that and organized uh, what you might call a farewell service. And uh, the chapel was really packed. And Professor Carl Bowman, Professor Morgan at Iowa Wesleyan College came over and 
uh, really gave the, the organ a workout, and many of us had not heard the organ uh, for several years, so it was wonderful to hear it. Well, the upshot of it is that the Maharshi people uh, gave the organ uh, to the city, uh, which in turn uh, gave it uh, to the board uh, that was in the process of planning uh, this building. And uh, the organ was meticulously taken apart by John Conant, who first came to public notice here when he came to town and noticed that the courthouse clock was not working. He went to the board of supervisors and said, I think I can get that working for you. He did, and it is. And uh, he's a retired engineer. He just loves this sort of thing. So he took the organ apart, wrapping a lot of it in tissue paper and so forth. And the, the pipes have been stored uh, in a couple, three basements uh, here in town. The console the organ has been stored. And it is now in the process of being reinstalled here in the Sondheim uh, Theater. And if you are in the theater at any time you're able to stay here, if you face the stage and look up the upper left-hand corner, you will see uh, a screened area, and there are, you will see behind the screen, you will see pipes. And uh, Mr. Conan has also told me that there are several places uh, on stage where the organ can be plugged in so it can be played from a number of places. One of the things that I should add here that yeah. unfortunately when the organ came to the, the town and the building, this building was in the process, the plans were in the process of being developed. They were not set in concrete. So the architects were notified uh, right away to leave room uh, for the organ pipes and uh, to put in some outlets where it could be plugged in. Uh, so, uh, and one thing that was specified, we don't want the council in a permanent location, like a sore thumb in the middle of the stage or something like that. Well, fortunately, this is all developed. It can be put on wheels and what Mr. Conant wants to do, and the other one, uh, is to uh, put in electronics and not have the old uh, wind uh, pipes and all. Now this is the same thing uh, that the Presbyterian Church did here a couple of years ago when uh, their new organ to had a real background in uh, organ playing. Now uh, that informed the church uh, leadership that the wiring in the console uh, is in very bad shape and there's some things we can't do. And the, uh, the church uh, board decided at that time, well, maybe we better overhaul the organ and so on. And it cost us something like $50,000. The organ had been completely overhauled and the electronics have been installed, which were not available the last time it had been overhauled, some 50 years or so ago. So uh, the Parsons College organ will be brought up to date eventually. Uh, so if any of you would like to leave 50,000 or so uh, for the reinstallation of the organ, I would be gratefully uh, received. But at any rate, uh, the other thing that's going to be uh, installed eventually uh, will be one of the stained glass windows, one of the big windows from the uh, uh, Bar High Chapel. And those windows are now being stored out at the Bovard uh, stained glass, uh, glass studio and uh, will be installed. Now, uh, Susan Welding refers to Roberts's dislike of those windows, and that uh, he vowed that he was going to get rid of them. And she sort of, you can hear her chuckle and hear that the windows, despite his dislike, were still there. I would have to say that 
those windows have been controversial over the years. And I recall uh, one story that uh, a group of persons in uh, Fairfield women have been on a tour of cathedrals and art museums and so forth under the leadership of one of the top curators from the Art Institute of Chicago. And, uh, and they had a wonderful time with this tour. His knowledge of the windows and paintings and all, that was wonderful, marvelous. So they invited him to come out here uh, for a meeting and give a lecture and so forth. And uh, so they took him into our high chapel to see Murphy's stained glass windows. And apparently he just let out something of a bellow. My God, those are the most awful windows I've ever seen. <laughs> sort of, I understand, sort of crushed uh, some of the lady. But there were others that had agreed uh, with this assessment over, over the years. But be that as it may, they are part of the building. And so I think it would be wonderful to have at least one of those windows uh, out here in the Parsons the College Alumni Hall as a memento. Also, you probably have noticed uh, there are some of the pews from uh, our high chapel that are in use out here, both in the alumni hall and in the uh, lobby for uh, of the uh, of the building here. And uh, it is also planned that uh, some Parsons pews will be used in the. Uh, 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 new little chapel that's going to be part of the new hospital that is going up just south of town uh, out near the intersection of Highway 1 and the US 34 bypass. And so there will be some of those here installed there. Uh, so uh, then in 1913, as I mentioned, Parsons Hall was built. And then we go into a period. Uh, the 20s, where there is considerable student growth, and indeed, until the Roberts era, the 1920s saw the largest enrollment in the college history. Uh, in the late 20s, uh, over 700 uh, students uh, were enrolled here. And then, of course, came the Depression. And the Great Depression uh, was disastrous, not only for Parsons College, but for a great many colleges. The problem was just simply how to keep the doors open, how to keep students here. And <clears throat> Keith Coltrane, who was dean of the college for quite a number of years, a long time faculty member, and uh, also graduate of the college, tells me that a great many students, including himself, uh, came to college uh, with a half a bead from the hall, whatever, and uh, that is how they paid their tuition. And uh, it's sort of hard to imagine, but that's uh, how it was done. Well, uh, by 1955, legend has it, which was really uh, propagated largely by the new incoming president, that he found the college to be on its last legs and it would probably uh, close a year or two. Well, <clears throat> real question as to the real accuracy of that prediction. But it is true that the college enrollment had gotten down uh, to something under 300, and uh, times were really very hard. Well, <clears throat> now I just want to mention a, a couple of uh, books here that I brought with me. Uh, one is the, the Parsons College Bubble by James D. Kerner. This came out in 1970 and it is a, uh, a very good analysis uh, of the Roberts era. And the thing that uh, I can summarize here by saying the Kerner points out that there is lots of blame to pass around 
between Art between Miller Roberts on the one hand and the North Central Association on the other. Hand. And is very critical of North Central in that they never, never spell out for the trustees exactly what they were complaining about. And the trustees, over a period of time, <clears throat> Roberts had managed to work off the board trustees who were critical and questioning, and he had on the board those who were uh, all for him. And, as Turner points out, the board of trustees, as was constituted, was not a whole lot different uh, from boards of trustees and colleges all over the country. Most of them were composed of busy, mostly male, a few women, uh, that has changed a lot more the college boards now. And I think a lot of them are much more inclined to ask searching questions than uh, men are. But at any rate, uh, a lot of these boards were composed of men who were busy. They had their own problems, their own affairs uh, to look after. They expected their leadership, the president, to uh, do the business. And so, they really don't know a whole lot of what's going on. They only meet occasionally, and uh, they don't always meet on campus. And so consequently, uh, the board was not very well really informed. And he was very critical of the North Central for not having been very specific, making sure that their reports got to the board members and that they were read and could be acted upon. And he also was very critical that a lot of, of uh, Roberts's figures, reports, and so forth uh, were erroneous. And I do remember one board member who was on the board, then off the board, and then back on the board, uh, was Wally McCallum, president of Morell's. And he was brought on the board uh, late 50s, and, he, and his specialty was accounting. And his, he began to question a lot of Robert bookkeeping and figures very early in the game. <coughs> and uh, he said he soon found himself being asked not to run again uh, to be on the board. <coughs> what I met him to talk with him was after Roberts had been fired and uh, McCallum was invited back on the board. He said, I never did like his figures, but I sure like the figures I'm seeing now, even though they're pretty grim. And uh, that was part of the problem. The, uh, the other thing we're running oh, uh, way over time. The other thing is, of course, when the college lost accreditation, and, and, and no college, Turner points this out, no college in the country, he thinks, was examined by an uh, accrediting association more than Parsons College. If I remember what he said correctly, he said in 11 years, Parsons had uh, six examining teams visit the campus, and no college, he said, had done more because of the North Central Association put great store by the uh, self-study and he said, no college, he thought, could be more introspective than that Parsons College, had more self-studies, and so forth. Uh, but what happened, of course, was that uh, there was a tremendous drop in enrollment. And until 1968, when the North Central, 69 was the uh, North Central um, considered uh, college to be a a recognized candidate for uh, uh, accreditation, which allowed the college then to get back its uh, uh, access to government grants and state grants and foundation grants and so forth. Uh, and did the enrollment start to pick up? And then we, uh, in 1970, and this I think is one of the things that I've discovered that many people living right here in Fairfield didn't know even though it was in the paper, 
ham on the radio. But in 1970, the college became a fully accredited college and member of the North Central Association once again. Now, there are many, there are many people locally uh, that didn't know that when we closed in 1973, that we were a fully accredited college. But to me, and I think to many others, the irony of the whole thing is that from a faculty and student standpoint at least, we were not as strong in 70 or in 73 as we had been uh, in 67. Because we, in the loss of enrollment, of course, we lost a lot of faculty. And uh, the other result was that while we were still a good college and still had good faculty and good student body, we weren't uh, there. Uh, and I think it was about 1,500 or thereabouts uh, enrollment when the college closed, as against uh, about 5,200 in 1966. And part of the problem was that we were. Uh, we had a lot of buildings, a lot of dormitories, and uh, all that kind of space that was now standing empty, and but was still uh, mortgaged. Now, the uh, two insurance companies, Connecticut General and Connecticut Mutual, that uh, held most of the mortgage, they were quite willing to work with the college. After they did not want to see the college bankrupt because they would lose their investment. So they were willing to work. But we were running out of cash, out of money, how to pay the bills, how to pay the salaries, so forth. Well, it finally dawned on administration and trustees the one thing that had not been working in the books of the library. And there were about 200,000 uh, volumes in the library. So we took out a loan. A uh, group of four banks uh, with the Merchants uh, Bank in uh, Cedar Rapids being the lead uh, bank in it, and they mortgaged the uh, library books and got enough money to keep the college going for a couple of more years. But finally, by 1973, they didn't have enough money to pay the interest to the banks on the uh, library loan. And the banks decided to foreclose. And uh, that was when, on the advice of an attorney and professor of law at Drake University, that uh, they take the college into uh, Chapter 11 in Federal Bankruptcy Court in Hawaii. And uh, the judge up there would have men on And he threw the college into Chapter 7 immediately appointed a receiver and said, you're finished. And uh, that was it. We were uh, really kind of, I think, done in by the judge of bankruptcy, but uh, I'm no accountant and all the details I don't know. There is another interesting item on this that uh, several, uh, after the college had lost its accreditation, and the only preceded me, Chuck and Barry, had died of a massive heart attack. When one of the visiting teams from the North Central was here, happened right in the midst of visitation. And I tell you, there was a very shook up group of men when I met with them the following morning. I was the associate team at the time. I met with them the following morning, and they had just heard that the dean had been talking with the day before when I was dead. And uh, it uh, really had a pretty, uh, pretty shook up. They had all of us uh, pretty shook up. Well, after that, I, mean, I, I became eventually the dean and succeeded Chuck in the job. And uh, Keith McWilliams, an attorney, a graduate of the college at uh, Fairfield uh, Native and attorney in the law and had over the years done legal work uh, for the Board of Trustees. I uh, was now 
you're doing something, going over some material with the board or some board members in the administration. And he brought one of his young uh, members of the firm with him. I got to talking a little bit with the young attorney. And he said to me, why? Why did you people take your case in the federal court in Chicago? And that was a question that has bugged me for years. I wonder why. And the only thing I could think of is, well, the firm of attorneys, the college was used at the time, was a Chicago firm, and the North Central headquarters were in Chicago, and so they took it into uh, federal court there in Chicago. Well, he said, it's really too bad that you did that. And, and he said, if you had taken it into Judge Stevenson's court in Des Moines, and Judge Stevenson then was the federal district judge for the Southern District of Iowa, Judge Stevenson would have automatically given Parsons College a stay and would have you know, held things in abeyance until he had time to hear both sides and sort things out. So I don't guarantee that he wouldn't have agreed finally with him. Said, well, no. He would have felt from his fault. I said, well, how do you know that? He said, I clerked for Judge Stevenson when he got out of law school. I know how he operated. But you know, that, that sort of bugged me ever since, much too late at that time. And one other thing that I think is kind of interesting about uh, the judge we had, he was a retired federal judge, but he was brought back into service. And this was Judge Julius Hoffman, who gained great notoriety a couple of years later as the judge in the Chicago 7 uh, case. And you may recall the Judge Hoffman and the attorneys and the, uh, the clients and attorneys had shouting matches and so forth, uh, hardly dignified in the courtroom. It was just all kind of, kind of ironic that uh, it, happened, it happened that way. Uh, Turner does kind of sum up, was justice done? Well, he thinks that Judge Hoffman's decision in the case, based on what was presented, was the right decision. That's what he had to say. Uh, but he thinks the North Central should not have uh, behaved the way it did. It should have been much more upfront in his criticism. And he thinks that uh, the college uh, should have taken action uh, earlier. So uh, you can debate, debate. And it's one of those things that I have noticed that the North Central Association, as far as I've been able to tell, doesn't, doesn't seem to do a lot of discrediting uh, colleges ever since. And uh, also, one other thing I would add, that when we closed in June of 1940, or 1973, excuse me, uh, I got, got my copy of the Chronicle of Higher Education. And they had a very interesting article about 40-some colleges that had closed that spring, including Parsons College. Uh, some of the colleges were older than Parsons. Some of them were community colleges, uh, and some uh, were newer, some four-year colleges. Uh, you want to remember the timing. The draft was ended. The war in Vietnam was taking down. Lots of young men who had fled to the colleges because Congress had this draft law that as long as you were in good standing on college, you uh, could stay in college. And those of us that were in the classroom knew very well that a lot of the young fellows sitting in front of us really uh, didn't want to be there. And a lot of them, once the draft ended and they were no longer subject to it, a lot of them worked in the classroom, ours and others. And so many schools found that just simply couldn't overcome that loss. We did have one very 
really one very good program going at the time it closed, airport management, and connecting with it, I think we were kind of unique at the time. We had opened an air ROTC unit, and the first that uh, the only commanding officer of that unit is with us this morning, uh, your health man, uh, who suddenly found himself uh, with a department that was being closed. And I don't want to steal Bill's stories, but I think his line about calling Washington and telling them that we are closed out here, and that well, they'd send a truck eventually, you got the stuff. If you want your equipment and thing, you better get that truck to here immediately or it's going to be locked up and you won't get it. And I don't think the ROTC, they've been kicked off many campuses, but I don't think they've ever been forced out quite the way that this one was. Happily, Bill and Bob liked Fairfield. Uh, while Bill had to finish out his tour of duty elsewhere, not staying, <coughs> they kept their house. And when Bill retired, they came back to uh, Fairfield to live, and everybody was happy to have them. Well, there's more we can go on with, but uh, as a famous line, it's been good to talk to you. And I'm sure you have been. history. Uh, this is part of our outreach program. We'll be video DVD taping everything today. Those will be available. You can sign up for your friends or people who weren't able to attend. Also, Bob and myself have started a Parsons College Remembered program on one of our local public access radio stations. Uh, Vera, young Dorothy Bell, uh, Edith Jordan, the Gamers who are just coming in the door right now. We're trying to capture each decade verbally on an hour interview. And we will get back to that this fall, and we'll start to make those available through the Parsons College Alumni e-newsletter, which if you haven't subscribed already, we do have copies of it out here. So it's a good way to communicate for an annual fee of $5. And Mr. Campbell will talk about that. We would like to adjourn for just about uh, 25 minutes. There's coffee, there's water, there's uh, vending machines, and then we about 10 minutes till we will go into the theater and have our official convocation and dedication program at that time. Thank you for being with us. Please enjoy and mingle. Thank you.